Welcome back. Um, the next talk is in English. Falls ihr den nächsten Vortrag lieber auf Deutsch hören möchtet, C3Lingo hilft euch hier weiter. Uh, C3Lingo.org als Adresse. As usual, you can raise questions to the upcoming talk um, using IRC, Twitter, Mastodon um, with the hashtag 40 um, remote rhein Ruhr stage That's R3S. Um, and then those will find its way to the Q&A sessions. And also, if you have the time, please consider to help out writing some subtitles for the talks. Um, those would, uh, that would help a lot, actually. All right. Our next talk is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, um, Automatic Identification System, Open Data is in the Air. Our speakers are SkyMaster, he's a um, fan of network technologies and a ham radio enthusiast. And um, the other speaker is JJX, a network administrator. Uh, he loves trains, planes, ships and especially high antennas on um, building roofs. With that, um, one last remark. It is perfectly normal if you only see the slides. Enjoy the talk. Welcome to our talk, ADSB and AIS. Open data is in the air. Who are we? I'm SkyMaker. And I'm JJX. We are part of the local hackerspace Chaos Consulting, which is located in Iserlohn in the western part of Germany. Our space consists of about 25 members at the moment and outside of COVID, we meet up in our space in the city center. For the last seven years, we are tinkering around with a lot of projects. We build mesh networks with Freifunk, contribute to OpenStreetMap and have lots of Arduinos, ESPs and Raspis while to colorful blinking LEDs. In the last two years, we shifted our activities to the online world due to which some projects in our space came to an halt, but others gained much more traction than before, like the one we are going to show you today. If you like, you can stop by our virtual space in the work adventure world and say hello to us. Talking of Congress, we have attended the last real life Congresses in Leipzig and Hamburg. So maybe you have already seen us and our project. Yes, the Congress is the most important event for our space. We're really stoked about giving our first talk this year. One of our projects is, as mentioned before, Freifunk. With Freifunk, we provide open and free wireless network connectivity for 13 cities in our area. Besides the usual installations in the city center, we provide internet to multiple hundred refugees, often with the support of the officials and sometimes without. We use our gear to build networks for local events and festivals. When we have time to spare, we like to experiment and push the envelope of what we can achieve with our gear and knowledge. For example, we walk with a backpack full of gear onto hilltops and try to make long distance connections to the mesh. We call this hobby Freifunk Wandern. On one occasion, we were able to set up a 16.9 kilometer link with about 150 euros worth of gear. But what else can you do? As we are already on the roof, where we have network connectivity, power and mounting points, we started looking for other fun projects to do. One thing we experimented with are Freifunk connected webcams. From cheap security cameras from China to Raspi cams and even real digital cameras, we tried multiple options and delivered live feeds and time-lapse videos via the mesh. Weather sensors are another topic we explored. For example, the open source error project from Stuttgart's OK Lab or the project on one of our annual summer camps. With the error, we measure temperature, humidity and particles with an ESP and send the data to OpenSenseMap, which is another OpenStreetMap based project. 
Ham radio is another activity that comes to mind when thinking about radio waves and antennas. Quite a few of our space members are actually licensed ham radio operators, so it comes quite natural to incorporate ham radio and SDR into our hobby. We are using open source software like WSJTX, OpenWebRx, GQRx and many more to listen to the different analog and digital modes. Building antennas and optimizing the setup is a big part of the fun. As you can see, there is a lot one can do to keep you entertained for a while. But clearly we can't get enough and are always looking for the next interesting piece of technology to explore. ADSB is one of the things we found and took a closer look at. So, what is ADSB? In short, ADSB is a standard radio protocol which is used to track aircrafts. The automatic means uh, there's no input needed from the flight crew, it just works. The dependent means it requires data from the flight navigation systems, so it is dependent on that data, of course. ADSB transmits on 1090 megahertz, um, like the old secondary radar, which is still used. That's the thing with the transponder, if you've heard about that. There are two different, different kinds of ADSB. ADSB in is mostly used in the US, and there it works on 978 MHz, but it's roughly the same protocol and that provides weather data and traffic information for the aircrafts. ADSB out is mandatory in the US since uh, 2020 and Europe since 2016. So every commercial aircraft flying to or from there should send ADSB reports. That sounds interesting, but how do you get the data? Of course, there's software to decode ADSB messages. It's called Dump1090 and luckily it's open source. It has about 900 forks on GitHub, but the most known forks are the ones of Mutability and FlightAware. Fun fact, Mutability works for FlightAware, a commercial flight data service, for quite some time now so he maintains the FlightAware fork. It supports the raw serial messages over UDP, but it also generates formatted JSON files. With these JSON files, it feeds a nice map. So this is the web interface of Dump1090. You see the aircrafts above you, like you would expect, um, and aircrafts which you received a position from are highlighted green in the table on the right side. Above the table you see the received data of the aircraft, like altitude and speed, but also when the last message was received. So here's the next acronym. We've talked about aircrafts. Similarly to ADSB for planes, we can use AIS to track ships. AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. Its purpose is collision avoidance and for commercial ships it's mandatory even though you should have it on your pleasure craft so big ships can see you. AIS works in the Marine VHF radio band roughly between 161 and 162 megahertz. And its transmission is coordinated with time slots. There are 4,500 time slots per minute. And the transmission coordination needs time synchronization since we don't want all ships to transmit at the same time. The time synchronization happens over GPS, which is obviously needed already for the position calculation. In the AIS protocol, there are 22 message types in total. For us, only four of them are interesting. The first one is the position report, 
Um, that's just the position report of a ship, obvi obviously. But also there's um, there are base station reports where base stations report their position. And the last two are pretty interesting because um, ships can also transmit static and voyage related data like the name of the ship, the dwarf, uh, the length, the width, or even the destination and the ship type like a military ship or a container ship or a tug. And last but not least, there's an aids to navigation report where visible boys or non-visible boys um, or even temporary danger areas uh, can send their position or these can be sent also by a base station. Okay, cool. So let me track ships. Of course, there's also software for that. It's called AIS Catcher. It's fresh and new software from the Netherlands under heavy development and it has significantly better reception than other software. It only outputs raw serial messages, so you have to decode these serial messages through GPSD, which is pretty old but very good software on Linux. It has support for multiple SDRs like the RTL SDR or the AirSpy or the HackRF. And of course, it's open source. But before the software can do its job, we need some hardware to receive and the decode the data. First things first, the antenna. A good antenna built for the desired frequency is key to a strong signal. We like to use ground planes because they are easy to build with a minimal set of tools and cheap materials. An alternative are PCB antennas, which are readily available for LESB. Those antennas are small, robust and precisely built for the frequency without costing an arm and a leg. If about 20 euro isn't an issue, PCB is our preferred way to go. Either way, the building instructions for both antennas are available in our Git repository. Beware of cheaply made antennas with very poor performance available from the usual online sellers. On the top left, you can see a ground plane antenna. On the bottom left, you can see a PCB for 1090 megahertz. And on the right, you can see a PCB in an outdoor worthy enclosure. Next up, you need a receiver to convert the analog signal to digital. There are special ADSB and AIS receivers on the market, which are rather costly. Instead, we'll use the beloved RTL SDR stick. These DVB-T sticks are the cheapest way to buy a software-defined radio capable of tuning into a relatively wide range of frequencies. Speaking of which, not every stick is suitable for our use case. You want to look for a 820T or 820T2 tuner and avoid fitty power tuners. Reason is the frequency hole and poor gain settings on the lateral models. To connect your antenna with the receiver, a piece of coax cable is needed. The cable should be as long as needed to mount the antenna in a good spot and as short as possible as every meter adds to the signal loss. The quality of the cable and connectors also has an impact on the signal loss. We usually go for RG58 with a pair of name brand SMA connectors on each end. As the SDR receiver is not designed for ADSB nor AIS reception, it has some flaws. Due to the wide frequency range, signals on neighboring frequencies, for example mobile phone networks, can overload the receiver. A solution is a bandpass filter for the desired frequency which will decrease signal strength on unwanted frequencies. The filter should be installed directly on the receiver input to be as effective as possible. The effect of a bandpass depends on the location of the receiver, but in general it's always a good idea to install one. While there are SDR dongles with built-in bandpass filter, 
A dedicated filter is the better option. In some scenarios, with very crowded frequencies, the combination of both a built-in and additional filter yield the best results. The last piece of hardware needed is a PC to install the software on and process the data stream. While in theory nearly any old or new PC would work, we tend to use the ubiquitous Raspberry Pi. It has enough processing power for our task while being affordable and sips on power, which is a big plus running 24-7. Without active cooling, it is an absolutely silent setup and without any mains power anywhere near it, it's quite safe to play with. Everything tied together into an outer capable enclosure can look like this. Such a setup can be mounted outside near the antenna to reduce cable loss and can be fed entirely by power over Ethernet via a single network cable. On the left, you can see an ADSB and AIS outdoor setup. In the middle picture, you can have a look inside such a setup containing a Raspberry Pi, USB Wi-Fi adapter, SDR dongle with filter and a boost converter for energy. We also use small mobile setups based on Pi Zeros with a power bank for traveling. The two antennas of a mobile setup can be seen on the right mounted to a telescopic antenna pole. Now show me the planes and ships. With all the data, we needed a way to visualize it. The command line output, however, didn't cut it for us. We wanted, strangely enough, a graphical user interface. Wouldn't it be great to have a website to look at all planes and ships from all receivers combined? While there were commercial options for one or the other, there seemed no solution for both. And we don't like the commercial aspect of most sites. The only logical solution was to start our own project and that is what we did six years ago. So this is the map. Obviously you can see the aircraft and ships we receive. On the right side you have the aircraft table and several buttons for different features of the map. We will show you some of them now. If you select a plane, this is what you get. In this case, it's the approach queue in Frankfurt. You see the colorful tracks which change with the flown altitude of the aircraft. And you can also see the model of the airplanes on the map, since we have icons for the 100 most common aircraft models. You can also see the received data of the selected aircraft on the right side, along with a photo of the aircraft model or even of the aircraft is itself, if we have one. Speaking of the plane icons, here you see some of them. Like already said, we made icons for the mostly seen aircraft models, like the Boeing 737, which you can see a second in the bottom line. But we also have icons for more rarely seen aircrafts, like the Ilyushin 76 in the bottom right corner, or above that, the Airbus Beluga or the new Beluga XL in the middle. Here you see a police helicopter hovering at an altitude of about 600 meters. You may have noticed that the helicopter has a different color than its track. That's because we color special vehicles like military or search and rescue vehicles in red and green so they are easier to spot on the map. Also, interesting airplanes and ships are highlighted in pink, like the Airbus Belugas or the Antonov 225, so if they appear on the map, they are definitely an eye catcher. The transparent blue aircraft is tracked with multilateration. The position of aircrafts which don't send their position for whatever reason can be calculated using the signal delay between at least three stations. That's another benefit thanks to the work of Mutability, who not only developed Thumb 1090, but also the multilateration server. On the right side you see several more layer options for the map. JJ will tell you more about them in a few seconds. Some, but not all, ground vehicles on airports are also transmitting their position. Here you can see some trucks and also a truck of the fire brigade in Düsseldorf. 
not seen here is a transmission tower, which we think for testing purposes only sends ADSB beacons without a position. Since we have three stations close to Düsseldorf Airport, sometimes even that tower shows up on the map with the calculated position being accurate to around 20 meters. Just that you get an idea how accurate multi detuation can be. As already said, we are tracking ships and this is what it looks like. On the right we have the familiar sidebar with the ship's info. Beside the ship's name and call sign we show type, speed, direction and sometimes even the destination. On the map itself we see the vessels indicating the direction if possible and drawing a history track. The different special types of ships are color coordinated according to the aircraft color scheme. There is another great OpenStreetMap based project named OpenCMap. It shows ports, lighthouses and much more. As OpenCMap is very interesting to look at and it helps to understand the routes the ships are taking, we incorporated it as a switchable layer easily accessible from the sidebar. Talking of interesting ships, here you can see the tall ship Gorch Fock of the German Navy on the run from Kiel shortly after the expensive repair. Due to the high antenna position on one of the masts, it can be received and tracked from a longer distance than any other ships as seen here. Another interesting thing to look at is this ship which is anchored. Moved by wind and waves, it moves in a circular fashion around the anchoring point. But where does the boxy grid-like track come from? Well, it is the lack of resolution of the latitude and longitude information transmitted via AIS. While it won't be an issue under normal circumstances, you always have to keep in mind that the accuracy of the ship's position is limited by this. The whole action on the map only works due to the numerous stations feeding us data. These stations are listed with some stats and the approximate positions on the map. When selecting a station, you see some detail info and a list of MLAT sync peers. The more sync links, the much better multilateration will work. On the map, you can see a visual representation of the sync links to the neighboring stations and the quality of each link, where green is optimal and red unusable. In an area with many MLAT linked stations, as shown here, there is a good chance to track planes without position info quite accurate. The more data you have at hand, the more important it gets to have good means of filtering the data to find the bits you are looking for. At the moment we have the following filters in place. The filter by fix option allows you to show MLAT only planes for example. The by station filter allows us to only show the vehicles received by one specific station, which is very useful if you want to check on your station's coverage or just want to see nearby vehicles. With the altitude filter, you can limit the maximum altitude. As seen here, we selected a maximum altitude of 0 meters, which is equal to on ground. With this setting, you will only see planes on ground, ground vehicles and ships, which do not have a flying altitude, obviously. By the way, what you can see here is our ground coverage in Frankfurt. The by type filter allows to show only interesting or military or fire, rescue and law enforcement vehicles. A combination of all three is possible as shown here. And the filter works for aerial vehicles and waterbound ones alike. As we keep a history of all recent positions, we are able to create a heat map. The heat map gives an indication of where we have good coverage and where we are lacking. It is easy to spot traffic hotspots, for example here Frankfurt, Düsseldorf or Munich. The filters we have shown before are working for the heat map too, so we can create a heat map for a specific station, for airplanes or ships or even for a specified altitude to check the ground coverage. As aviation is heavily impacted by the weather, we include a precipitation layer, which we can do thanks to the open data policy of the German Weather Service. It can be very interesting to see the planes getting diverted in real time to circumvent areas of bad weather.
there are some more features and functions built in, but instead of showing you every little detail, you can explore the map yourself later on, as it is publicly available. We know some of you are eager to see statistics about collected data, so here we go. You can clearly see how the amount of flying airplanes decreased during nighttime. The daily peak is around 3 p.m., while the low is around 3 a.m. in the morning. Also, you find that the least aircrafts are flying on Saturday nights. We think that's because the big cargo hubs by DHL, UPS, and FedEx are closed on Sundays, so flights in the night decrease even more. The difference between night and daytime is around 400 planes in absolute numbers. You even see the up and down from night to daytime in the network graph since the received data correlates with the flights. Back to these two graphs. When you take a closer look, you see that the quantity of planes not sending a position is about a fifth of the total planes. So what we need is multilateration to track them. Compared with the quantity of planes without position, we can track only a third of them with multilateration right now. So there's a big potential which we can't use. There's only one solution for that. We need more stations. I think I don't have to say much about this. Does anybody know what happened in March 2020? Anyway, besides the incredible drop in March, there are two interesting things in this graph. You may ask yourself where these peaks on any other day come from. Well, in the spring, it was the weekend hobby pilots who pushed the numbers. In the summer, this gets mixed with the holiday flights, which were possible again at that time. Last but not least, you see the same effect with the fall holidays in Germany, starting mid-October and ending at the beginning of November last year. So here are the statistics about chips. The first station in Kiel is feeding us data since the end of May of this year. Then three stations near the Rhine in Düsseldorf joined in July and August. Hence, the increasing number of received ships over the first half of the graph. You can clearly see the peaks on the weekends when the most pleasure crafts are underway. Other than that, there's not the same day and night effect like we've seen with aircrafts. We think the reason for that is that ships also send their position when they are at anchor or moored. Aircrafts have to turn off their transponder when they reach the gate. Also, and I think that's the more significant reason, there are no restrictions like the flight ban at night for ships. All received ships are feeded into a database. Since we started receiving data in May of this year, we already saw 8,800 unique ships in total. It would have been even more if we wouldn't have restructured our database structure in September, and also if we wouldn't have forgotten to rewrite the, the insert query in the feeder script to these changes. Facepalm smiley. Some of you may ask yourselves what technologies we used. Well, we tried building it as independent as possible, but at some point we decided to use some small frameworks instead of reinventing the wheel. First of all, we use vanilla JS for the front end and CSS for the styling. All the plane and ship icons are made in SVG. For the map, we use leaflet.js, which is a great toolkit for building interactive maps, even more so when extended with some plugins. Speaking of which, we use leaflet realtime for all the realtime action on the map. Leaflet Heat is used for the generation of the heat maps, and Leaflet Active Area is used for some UI enhancements. For all the interactive tables in the sidebar, we make use of Tabulator. In 
the backend, we use bash, php, jq, mariadb, and sqlite. But uh, let me give you a brief introduction on how we process the data. So this is what a simplified version of our data flow looks like. We are starting in the uh, top left with our Raspberry Pi. We name it ADSberry Pi. And uh, we start with the incoming data from the SDR running into the dump 1090 process, which then will uh, feed the local web server <coughs> with the um, station's uh, let info. And it will feed the ADSB service running on the Pi, which will then forward all the uh, JSON file with uh, planes and infos to the web server in our data center. The web server will then uh, push all the info to the live data service, which will uh, combine the data of all incoming stations and will uh, combine it to an output feed, which will then be served by a web server to the clients. But there's more than that. Multilateration works that you have installed the MLAT client on your Raspberry Pi, which is feeded with the station raw data. Um, the client then pushes the station raw data to the MLAT server, which will uh, use the data from the Raspberry Pi and other MLAT clients to calculate MLAT positions and will feed it back to the Pi which is the blue arrow, MLAT backfeed, which will then use it to feed it to its own web server. But the MLAT server will also feed it to a service, which will create an MLAT JSON that will be feed to the live data service, where it will be combined and be available on the web server. So our clients will be feed it with LAT and MLAT information. You see the live data service also feeds the stat service which uh, uses a database, which is a MariaDB, to uh, generate history and statistics data and will uh, build a statistics JSON to serve it to the web server and then to the clients. But there's more than ADSB, AIS. We're starting on the top left again with the AIS catcher which will decode the AIS uh, data from the SDR dongle and uh, will push the NEMA feed into the GPSD. And the GPS pipe will take the NEMA feed from GPSD and convert it to a more or less readable JSON file, which we will then feed into our AIS service on the Pi. The AIS service will push the information to the web server in our data center, which will then feed it into the live data service. The process here is a bit different because the live data service will push the data into a database and uh, our live data out service will generate the feed for web server and client from this database. That are two different approaches on handling the data the AIS uh, data is uh, with database in place, while the ADSB data will work fully without the database and the database is only for history uh, generation. You may ask why uh, we use uh, two different approaches. Um, well, this is uh, due to the fact that we implemented ADSB uh, a long time before we implemented AIS. And from the things we learned from ADSB, we created a yeah, better process for the AIS. Maybe in the future we will work on the ADSB data handling, but uh, at the time we don't know. So we have shown you uh, all the little features we have implemented. We have shown you the tech stack, how it works, the hardware and so on. The only thing left is to show you or tell you what we think is next. What we like to do is implement more icons for different airplane types and photos of airplanes 
so you have a nice better experience in the UI. The statistics is a weak point until now, so we want to improve on that and build a completely new statistics backend and frontend to give you more and uh, more beautiful statistics because we really like statistics and graphs. Another uh, kind of weak point is responsive design. So while you can open the uh, website on a mobile device, depending on device and operating system and used browser, your mileage may vary. So there's room for improvement too. We can never have enough stations, so we definitely want more stations, but uh, we cannot do that without help. And uh, maybe sometime in the future, we want to experiment with another data source form. At this point, we have three, normal ADSB, then MLED, and then AIS, but who knows? what we'll find and maybe we'll implement it. So how can you participate? You can of course build a station or you can feed us data from an already existing receiver which is feeding to another service. Right now, most of the receivers are located roughly in the western and southern parts of Germany. There are also people feeding data in Erbil and in Washington. If you live in an area without coverage and want to feed us data, we would be happy about that. But we would be also happy if you would feed us data from a receiver which is just two kilometers away from an already existing one, since this would gain coverage in terms of low flying aircrafts nearby and it increases multilateration quality. In any case, have a look at our instructions on how to build a receiver and how to feed us data in our GitHub repository. And if you have an idea or a question, talk to us. The map is available at adsb.chaosconsulting.de and if you want to feed us data, send us an email or even better, join us on our Mumble server. We will hang out there most of the time doing Congress. We also have a Telegram group, which you are free to join. Last but not least, the source code of our website is of course available at GitHub. Thanks for your time and we are looking forward to answering your questions in the Q&A now. Thanks both of you for the awesome talk. Uh, there were a couple of questions from people on the internet. Um, I'll just pick a couple of these. Uh, first one would be, what measures are implemented to protect the privacy of pilots um, who are identifiable by being the sole users of their own aircraft? Yeah, good question. Um, I think there is no such way of uh, doing that as the data is unencrypted uh, in the air and everybody can uh, receive it as shown. So you can't uh, really do that. If we would do it, it would be uh, too late for it because the data is already out there. All right, thank you. Uh, then it appears that in, in another group is doing something very similar. Um, their question is, um, We've got a, um, a hug RF on a Raspberry Pi 4 on the roof, um, but have huge stability issues, especially with um, OpenWebRx. Uh, did you experience anything alike? We're not using the hack RF, but we're using RTL SDR dongles. We have seen uh, stability issues with uh, older and uh, cheaper dongles. We don't know if it is because the dongles are some years old or because uh, they were very cheap dongles. But uh, yeah, we changed these dongles for newer and more expensive ones and haven't seen these issues again, but uh, we can say for sure. All right, thank you. Um, given that AIS is not that popular in inland waterways apart from the rhine donau region, um, is there anything you can recommend for tracking inland boats? 
I don't know if mm -hmm. I got the question right, but um, there is AIS on the different uh, canals in Germany, so Dortmund Ems Canal and so on, where well, I've seen it. Um, so you can track ships uh, via AIS, even if you're not that near to a canal, if you're in a good spot, maybe on a hilltop. And yeah, use an antenna and an RTL SDR dongle and check for yourself if you can get some messages in. Right, thank you. Um, I hope I get the next question correctly. Um, how often do people complain that you do it unfiltered and so uncommercial? Never. <laughs> Straight answer, thank you. Until now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the next part is a bit of a longer question. Uh, we maintain a marine traffic station, which I kind of inherited from a former colleague. Uh, is there anything else that you dislike about marine traffic other than that only marine traffic is tracked? And could I use our setup antenna to send data to your project and to marina traffic at the same time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll take that one. Um, it depends on the type of station. If it is, uh, yeah ready station or ready built station i don't know what is uh, can do but uh, with a, a homemade raspberry pi based station there's a very good chance it, that you can use it to feed more than one service by uh, installing one and adding the scripts or feeding clients for another service um, yeah what uh, do we like about uh, these services or what we don't uh, wasn't really a question uh, in terms of AIS because we started with ADSB and uh, at the time when we started there were uh, to our knowledge no good uh, non-commercial services there may be one today but um, yeah when we were uh, doing ADSB it was quite natural to add AIS at some point so uh, we never thought about it if it was a good idea or if it is needed we just wanted it all right thank you um next question would be you mentioned a mobile setup um how much power and mobile data does that one need well um power wise um with the raspberry pi zero around i don't know um you can you can power that with a with a power bank um and i don't know like one day should be should be possible um also for the for the data for the traffic um i think it's around one gigabyte but maybe jj knows that better than me yeah it's so a, a gigabyte a day yeah, it, it depends a bit on uh, how much traffic you have, how much messages there are to decode. But um, with a decent, uh, I think, 20,000 milliamp power bank, I got uh, about 30 hours of runtime for an ADSB only setup. And um, data um, depends uh, on what you see and what you get range wise and uh, plane count wise. But uh, with two gigabytes a day, you should be fine. So that is not a thing you want to uh, deploy on mobile data for a longer time, especially with uh, German kept uh, mobile tariffs. All right, thank you. But uh, you can fine tune that uh, down uh, to maybe a three second interval or whatever. Thanks. Um, another question is, is there more information on your MLAT implementation, uh, on how your MLAT implementation works? Um, basically, it's the normal multilateration server and client, um, but we also um, implemented uh, an S-tunnel um, so that the 
um, the connections from the clients to the server are encrypted, and that's it. All right, thank you. Um, next question, I hope I get the acronyms correctly. Um, where do you get the registrations for the ADSB um, ICAO addresses from? Is there an open database available? We use um, a database from 2018 that was licensed um, under the MIT license. Um, and we update that regularly. So when we see, so we are also spotters. So when we go spotting, we update uh, the database um, well with our own data. All right. Thanks again. Um, are there pl um, plans or projects to explore the new ADSC? Not yet. Maybe in the future. <laughs> All right, and um, I think that is the actually the final question. Um, how expensive is one ADS um, Berry Pi to build? Uh, that depends. Uh, there were times where you could build such a setup in an outdoor worthy enclosure for about 100 euros, but at the moment it is quite hard to get uh, hardware and uh, it uh, costs a bit more, but if you want a good ADSB only setup, you can work with about 120, 130 euros in Germany with a small little test setup without filter, without casing and so on. You can even go cheaper. You may have a Raspberry lying around or use just a laptop for a day or whatever. Then you can uh, yeah, buy an ADSB dongle for about 25 euros and uh, start the journey. A full setup with ADSB, AIS filtering, good antenna mounts, and all this stuff all around uh, 200 euros. All right, thanks. Uh, are you willing to take one more question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, is ADSB also used by smaller planes? Um, the person asking seems to live about 10 kilometers from a small airport without a uh, commercial service and is wondering if um, he or she could receive information from the GA planes that fly over the house. Yeah, sure. Not uh, every plane. Um, many of the smaller aircrafts uh, do not send their position information. So you can see the beacon, you can see it in the list. And if you have MLAT co coverage, uh, which means uh, at least three stations uh, receiving the plane, then you can get a calculated position. There may be smaller glider types that use other services such as FLARM or Open Glider Network. Yeah, but uh, many small planes uh, use ADSB in some form, so there would be something to receive. Thanks a lot. And just as a, a comment, a question that popped up a lot of times um, was how can I contribute to your project? And um, uh, it seems you answered these with the uh, second to last slide. Um, but uh, up to, to that point, that question came like three times. Um, yeah, so. Thanks again for your great talk. Thank you very much for answering all the questions. Um, it really is appreciated. Um, people watching the streams, you will now see a, um, another edition of the C3 News Show. And coming up afterwards are the lightning talks of today, the first round of the year. Um, thanks a lot. And if you have the time, please provide feedbacks to our speakers. That helps to improve and, um, yeah, it also is some kind kind of appreciation if you actually um, do not uh, do, do provide good feedback. Apparently, taken from the questions, a lot of you like to talk. So, again, thank you for the great talk.